thing to remember. Very simple classification. Our types of head injury you see these things. First is extracranial injury, cranial injury, intracranial injury. Sorry. Again, extracranial injury, cranial injury, just cal. Already we discussed these things. Calf injury, then intracranial injury. Intracranial injuries, again, there are several types. Again, that depends upon the particularly anatomical, meningeal dispositions and the particularly brain structure. So, uh, already on that particular topic, we ended there in my last class, that is EDH or extradural hemorrhage. As I know these things, that means intracranial hemorrhage are divided by these things. Extradural hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, just to remember these things, DAC, that means dura then arachnoid meter, then pyre meter, then brain. So naturally dura, just to remember these things, I am going on to the same topic, these things, extra dural, above dura or outside the dura, then sub dural, below dura, then sub arachnoid, below arachnoid, and there is no sub pyre actually because pyre is intimately adherent to the brain, it is inseparable. So, whenever the sub parallel hemorrhage, it is regarded as intracerebral hemorrhage. Again, just to try to see this thing, base of the skull is very important. Particularly, base of the skull here depends particularly the severity and types of the intracranial hemorrhage from the same trauma depends upon these things. Actually, you see these things here, anterior cranial fossa. Now, is the actual plate base, this mid cranial fossa. This phenotemporal dysfunction is very, very important that he said these things because frequently it fractures. Then this posterior cranial fossa. Posterior cranial fossa is largest and smooth. There is no, no much actually the, the projections there. But these things, mid cranial fossa, otherwise small, smooth. But actually the anterior side, this particular projection is very sharp. That's why the frequently intracranial, the severity of the intracranial hemorrhage, particularly brain hemorrhage, actually is more severe. And their hair intracranial fossa, though it is smooth, but here particularly because of these things, actually small plates and orbital plates, because of these things that are very thin and frequently ruptures and because of these projections, because that can cause damage to the things. So naturally, this uh, the simple structures, particularly these things, base of the skulls, is very important, remember. So already we discussed these things, but actually we ended on these things, actually uh, yesterday, last class, Extradural hemorrhage is completed. So today, actually, I shall continue from these things, subdural hemorrhage. Uh, again, again, recap. Are you reading surgery? surgery? Have you seen the surgery KP thus? The clinical methods of the surgical practice. Very now probably it is thus, I do not know. It is essential book. Everybody must have. Must have. Very lot and other things are essential group, particularly these clinical methods of the surgery, is thus is very essential group, it is so famous international book, uh, just always you read these things, actually this is taken from that book, particularly the expressions, the particularly pupillary signs of the intracranial hemorrhage, how we diagnose clinically, just from clinical examinations, actually what kind of internal hemorrhage actually occurred during the, due to the trauma, head injury. So it is actually Hutchison's papers, particularly pupillary change is very char characteristic of the internal brains and you can correctly diagnose the brain site and where actually it occurs. External hemorrhage continue this actually, external types is very healthy. So the subdural hemorrhage, again I told you that day, dura Dura is just below the skull, the meningeal layer below the skull. So again, the dural disposition is peculiar because outside that is the just a skeletal sides and the visceral side. Below, below the dura meter, though this dura is not, but actually the dura meter here, just I on these things, only these things it contains venous, only this dura matter separates actually it, just to accommodate the venous sinuses. Here actually you know these things, sagittal sinus, pseudo sinus, there are several sinuses are there actually that is actually inside the dura matter, inside the layers of the dura matter. And here this dura matter outside one is adherent to the skulls, again this is very very adherent in case of the child and 
and old because the child because sutures is continuous with the sutures that's why he told this thing extradural hemorrhage is uncommon in extremes of the age that means neither it's common in child young child nor it's common in the old age because old age dura mater is intimately by adhesions is adheres to the cow so naturally the blood blood cannot collect there and in child because of these things limitations so because there are sutures dura mater is so continuous with the outside things so naturally blood cannot accommodate and cannot actually expand that's why it is very very the uh, uncommon extradural hemorrhage is uncommon in extremes of the ages there is very clinical finding very important clinical finding or you remember because actually in future for clinical diagnosis of the head injury this information is very vital now here you see these things again a, a little bit of these things where actually subdural hemorrhage occurs the positions of the subdural hemorrhage as you know this is subdural sub means below so naturally if it is dura you see the dural layer you see dura no then the below these things are arachnoid then pia pia means below arachnoid here actually you see these things blood vessels is a venous sinus and all blood from this particular venous site from the skulls and other things actually pierces and goes down all the layers and ultimately it goes to the brain so naturally it traverses to all the layers ultimately the brain and artery also these things when it actually enters into the skulls through the foramina then again it traverses through the all the layers and ultimately reaches the brains but these things actually so naturally very 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 common the mainly things artery and venous all must be accommodated in the subarachnoid space that is subarachnoid common but subdural space there is not much do not many arteries are there epidural artery is there as i said is the epidural hemorrhage is always arterial because actually the branches of the meningeal arteries here in the accommodates the inside the, below the temporal bone temporal bone that's why is thinnest bone it frequently fractures and extradural severest extradural fetal extradural hemorrhage occurs here and that is very very common and that is there is always arterial that is actually the here if you know these things the branches of the meningeal artery there in the sinus is in the temporal bone and there, is a, there is a channel there so if you uh, still remember your uh, anatomical knowledge there and that fractures that that, that uh, structure this artery ruptures and there is severe hemorrhage external hemorrhage and it is thinnest bone and it actually anything accommodates there is artery that is very important artery so naturally that damages and so external hemorrhage is very arterial and very acute but here subdural hemorrhage is generally not acute most of the cases is very subacute or sometimes it becomes chronic and when during the post mortem examination autopsy examination most of the kinds types it was incidental finding that means it happens in very trivial injury but it not actually detected nobody detected there there was any trauma or any these things so severe, severe shaking of the brain subdural hemorrhage occurs and that doesn't produce any kind of sign any signs and symptoms so head injury is not detected but the hemorrhage occurs that is detected in case if a person dies from some other reasons and during the autopsy actually autopsy uh, we explore all the cavities all the cavities all the organs nothing spared during the autopsy there is this thing brain to foot that is head to foot everything all cavities must be examined during the autopsy so naturally in that cases though the cause of death is different that may be the but incidental finding we found the subdural hemorrhage there in this case that is actually the incidental finding so that sometimes that may be contributory to the cause of death itself the subdural hemorrhage may not be fatal but that is contributory to the actual cause so subdural hemorrhage here you see these things this is sinus this dura subdural means actually this is the place where subdural hemorrhage occurs and because of this rupture there actually this through the dura it comes and sinus is there because of this rupture it most of the cases is venous venous and this is the position where subdural hemorrhage occurs and mind it again i told this thing subdural space is not actual space but it can be easily separated and accommodates amounts of the blood and it spreads throughout the brain whole surface of the brain may be covered sometimes with the subdural hemorrhage so that is the peculiarity so that's why subdural hemorrhage rarely acute 
because of like ADH, because it can spray, it can spray. This is a large space, so naturally the pressure symptoms generally doesn't occur because of this hemorrhage. But ADH, because actually limitation, so it's small hemorrhage, small space, so naturally that elevates and causes pressure to the brain. So symptoms most acute, that's why EDH is often fatal, not HDH. HDH is often detected because of this particular thing, because sometimes actually incidental finding in autopsy. Subdural hemorrhage, actually this is the position below dura, above arachnoid pater. So naturally this is the place and so venous origin of the blood is venous. Important information always remember, again venous hemorrhage is generally not in spots. Arterial hemorrhage forceful. So bleeding, blood accommodates the more under pressure. So naturally it is acute swelling, but, but because of this venous pressure, so blood just oozes and sometimes it is acute. So there is not much accumulation of the blood. Hematoma is not that acute. So it is very important. Types. Uh, that's a, a theory questions how you write because actually these days all the questions generally is short or small and short questions sometimes in, uh, questions is the MCQ questions. So naturally you don't have to write the too many words but you have to provide some information. So this is the way the types of the subdural hemorrhage. So it is actually the is acute, subacute and chronic. So naturally simply say subacute what are the type short group. Small short note, short note means generally short note starts if you put four marks question short note. So definition must be there. First actually what is it? Definition, then types, then what is it? Then MLI. This four note, any uh, writing a good short note means actually it must be. It is the same in MD also, a UG, a PG, same types. Only the PG they write more and the UG you have to write in short. So naturally the same question, same short note if you give these things, the intracranial hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage is PG level, they will have to elaborate, they will discuss. It must be. But usually only just point wise, try to write just point wise, that gives more importance actually for your answer. So it is important these things. Uh, subacute type, why subacute type, particularly before going to the acute type, acute is uncommon, particularly in case of the subdural hemorrhage. Here subacute type usually see. Subacute, it's blood, it's bleeding occurs, but does not produce any symptoms because it spreads. It spreads means uh, subdural space, all of all, it covers whole surface of the brain. So naturally sometimes in the city, you see, it is found this thing, just as if a dish is placed over this thing, say so the plate is placed over a brain. If there is opacity and other things that can be detected. So naturally because there is not much elevation, no space occupying, so naturally it does not produce symptoms. But, but actually that remains there, that though does not produce symptoms of the head injury, neither it is fatal, so naturally it is generally considered as subacute. Because it becomes important when some other pathology occurs, so that contributes. So that is that precipitates the cause of death or contributes the cause of death in other cases. So subacute hemorrhage only other is it is just important not important it becomes subacute sometimes becomes chronic. So subacute the brain may or may not be damaged at all because of these things and subacute hemorrhage most of the cases this subdural hemorrhage as I said these things EDH is always traumatic. Just just sum up the EDH when trauma external hemorrhage trauma no pathological. EDH is never a pathological hemorrhage. It occurs only because of trauma. But subacute hemorrhage mostly traumatic. Mane mathai marle tobe hai, short lagle hai. No pathological reason. So there are some pathological reasons subacute. So naturally, is my this thing. So here brain may not be damaged at all. Again, I, I, I just said these things because it is the rupture of the venous channels. Bleeding occurs because accommodation. Blood may be thin, watery due to hemolysis. If to jama holo, clot, then again it is hemolyzed. The coagulation occurs or the organization occurs later on, then I tell you when it becomes chronic type. Then when it occurs weeks after weeks, several weeks, generally after four to six weeks, when we find this thing, that actually becomes chronic. Blood is there, 
but actually it's actually covered by a thin pseudo capsule and that is indication so diagnosis of the subacute chronic hemorrhage so that is the things the characteristics is there it is hemorrhage only you can find in autopsy because it is neither surgery sub surgery or the surgery it doesn't require surgical intervention so naturally what is subacute type actually it is known as the by when we see these things autopsy when we expose brain then you can see chronic types actually can symptoms then it can produce symptoms only afterwards is very very late three to six weeks and this thing there may be some headache there may be some uneasiness there may be some this thing this thing only it is diagnosed only after some investigations but actually this thing again incidental findings most of the cases this uh, type of subacute type and these things actually incidental finding generally in autopsy what we found in many 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 cases many cases uh, because we have to see brain always always in all cases of the autopsy we have to see because brain is important organ which actually is the cause of death it lies there so it must be explored and there must be point but subacute hemorrhage the mostly you see as a this thing these points you remember very important rupture bridges vein already this thing acute hdh is affect any age group the hdh may be traumatic may be pathological jemon edh ki bolechilam edh does not occur in extreme age group bachcher hoy na boyosh der old age hoy na so but here hdh affects any any age group that's why better baby syndromes better baby syndromes is a particular thing actually where the child death because of this parental abuse and that was a very important uh, incident actually the first the, there is a cafe syndrome which was actually defined at first actually in the england so that was a very important things the better baby syndromes often because of these things actually the checking see they are checking of the baby they said these things is parental abuse so naturally that is the things the subdural hemorrhage acute jo rare but in case of the acute hemorrhage subdural that may cause death and acute hemorrhage also just a space occupying lesion that means hematoma is acute and space occupied that actually causes pressure to the hemorrhage often it is associated with significant brain injury jodi tar theke acute hoy naturally that causes brain injury. acute type because of trauma when a traumatic injury subacute uh, acute hemorrhage often associated with the brain injury that and that becomes fatal Uh, some points, important points. Just to note these things: lucid interval. Again, the important sort. Of, what is lucid interval? Yes. But the lucid interval is a pathological, very very important because again, this forensic psychiatry. This time, person behaves as if a normal person, but still, brain injury is there, head injury existing. Again, these things. the period of that is the normalness period of normalness first because of it is, it, is, it is a particular case in the edh particular case of the edh i am going to just khelte khelte first act is miss head dashing do you know mathe dhakka legeche unconscious hoye geche abar bachcha uthe dariyeche that is actually recorded in 11 year boy abar uthe dariyeche abar khela chaliye geche khela complete koreche tar pore again she fallen ill and died Before actually put any diagnosis, that is that is very particular things actually happen. Is the eleven, twelve, thirteen actually young adults is very common. So that is the thing that is called the lucid interval. In lucid interval, dying declaration is another thing. Dying declaration probably it was discussed in class. Dying declaration, have you heard? This is actually legal cause. Dying declaration is a very important doctor's duty in particular in fatal accidents and other cases. Whenever patient admitted. Doctor must take the key. Your last wish will act a kotha ache about regarding the cause of death. It cause of death. You think no criminal action so? Who made it? Sab sumai doctor ko bolta hai how how it happened? How it happened? Burn injury, accident, stab injury, or anything like these things. If patient die, doctor must take. Otherwise, there will be very problems. Now, tar pori kuchh kono pori patient mara jaye. Kintu that is before death. He must have said some things regarding the cause of death. See, Karu, what name? Bolte pare? Kono incident bolte pare? Kono accident bolte pare? But that thing is 
but during this lucid interval o kintu sob bolte parbe but some problem is there uh, some kind of amnesia occurs so some kind of wrong information she may give which you know, is maybe taken away but it is very important that lucid interval even the valid will a person valid will when a will is strong everybody has to be conscious conscious meaning making will or conscious person has to be conscious and composed mind composed mind is kotha ta naam ache composed mind is ami bodhay tomra shuni ache composed mind is the important uh, important word in medical legal acquirements composed mind the person must have been in orient properly oriented conscious oriented and this thing mane she jeno bujhte pare ami ja bolchi thik bolchi tar consequence tai hote pare ami surgical ami ami for surgery i am giving consent surgery consent is must ami thik dichhi that means a person the legal importance is immense but in medical practice the consent and composement is two things is very very important very very whatever practice you do or a medical practice surgical practice whatever practice you do this thing so the composement is and consent for consent composement is very important so here it is important eda the lucid interval uh khub beshi eta na hoy dating is less elaborate amra ekhon theke boli autopsite koto din age hoyeche is very important to bolechile tar she sometimes she, he said these things just a 15 days back i was assaulted with a lathi or blunt instrument but actually 15 days back after 15 days back actually when the person dies we found this thing there is a sdi and we said this cause of death is sdi but we have to say has it occurred this thing says has it actually happened 15 days back or earlier or or much earlier so that dating is important to gauge actually to corroborate the time of allegation so it is very very important because this medical information is very important to corroborate তারা ও বলেছে 15 দিন আগে আমাকে মেরেছে কিন্তু দ্যাট অ্যাকচুয়ালি ডেটিং অকারস দিস থিং 6 উইকস ব্যাক সো মানে অ্যাকচুয়ালি দ্যাট ডিড নট হ্যাপেন অ্যাকচুয়ালি দ্যাট দা টাইম অফ দা অ্যাসল ইট ইট হ্যাপেন্ড আর্লিয়ার সো অ্যাকচুয়ালি দ্যাট মে বি কন্ট্রিবিউট তো এইভাবে আমরা বুঝি সেটা কি দেন আই এম অ্যাকচুয়ালি গোইং ফার্স্ট বিকজ देयर আর সাম अदर থিংস সাব অ্যারাগনয়েড হেমোরেজ তাহলে এসডিএইচ এর পরেই কিন্তু সাব অ্যারাগনয়েড चैनल CASF normal amount of the CASF in the general is not missing 100 to 120 ml like these things so naturally that information is very important information is for the MCQ it is very important and and for the medical legal explanation is very important so those things actually is very important is subarachnoid hemorrhage because there is actual space brain is movable in the subarachnoid that means when brain moves inside the skull brain is not fixed brain is not fixed like kidney brain is not fixed like just when the liver is not fixed but the brain is movable inside the brain that's why the so many injury to the brain occurs because of this movability and same peculiar disease particularly peculiar hemorrhage occurs particularly coup and contra coup injury because the brain moves like a ball inside so here and that whenever it moves actually the subarachnoid upper subarachnoid upper the fixed below these things and potential stress so the brain moves in this direction so what will happen as the brain moves it moves in the subarachnoid level just like this thing so there will be tear and ruptures of the vessels in the arachnoid space that's why injury is very very common in subarachnoid space almost 90% of the if traumatic injury or whatever injury the subarachnoid space injury is very very common but may not be so fatal may not be invented failure may not be acute but common incidental failure whatever it may be and that is the things actually what is that why the subarachnoid space is so important important in these regions because it is actual space which contains because all the vessels actually going to the brain actually pass into the subarachnoid space and because it's movable that causes tear in the ruptures of those vessels so hemorrhage occurs in the subarachnoid space and subarachnoid hemorrhage the subarachnoid hemorrhage is sabse ke bada kotha ji clinical symptoms khub beshi hoy 
What is this thing? Sabrana Sinanaj? What are the clinical symptoms? Signs? What is it? Neck rigidity because of this irritations to the brain. Carnage signs probably. Uh, again, just use the important things always you remember. And that actually will be the thing. So because actually by this way, this is the clinical examination, by this way you can know the internal hemorrhage. So this thing, Karnix, that that's why subarachnoid hemorrhage may not be fatal, but actually that gives an indication. So this thing, neck rigidity, neck rigidity, neck rigidity, just, just like it happens in the tetanus also, tetanus, but there is a, a difference. So you have to differentiate whether it is tetanus or it is actually internal brain hemorrhage. So Karnix sign is a important subarachnoid hemorrhage. So subarachnoid hemorrhage. You see the points you note know, already we discussed. Again, the anatomical dispositions, meningeal dispositions, you must remember. Mening meningeal disposition means again these things, dura, arachnoid meter, pia meter. So all these things. So, lie between pia and arachnoid, arachnoid space is actual space already maintained, you see. The uh, containing blood vessels, portions of the cranial nerves, yeah, particularly the particularly uh, spinal uh, the Cranial nerves are open at the Kijiku Thaki, the Jacha Gandhi, Optikosi, or Kirchene, or CSA. CSA, the most common form of traumatic intracranial hemorrhage. Abarabolici, almost always traumatic hemorrhage would have Marle, Mathaji, the Chot Pai, acute EDH, the Hoysa, the Traumati Habakis to Havana. If they can trauma boost the Barbana, if the hemorrhage is very common. Already I told this thing. Mathai Marle is East Hoy. 90 percent, Joto hemorrhage, very, very common hemorrhage is inside the brain in the subarachnoid space. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is common. Most common form of traumatic intracranial hemorrhage. Bleeding, artery venous. EDH is not bleeding, source arterial. Even if you artery venous, and both artery and venous, because all the vessels passing through this channel, and this is a space where brain can move. Brain can move over the layers in the subarachnoid spaces, so it tears, it ruptures the vessel. Our goal is bleeding artery venous mostly from ruptured very region. Arachnoid cause is actually very important, very important short note for you and for PG also. These things very important. Very any regions, any region is malformation. Malformation is actually this vessel sometimes is thin wall and becomes a balloon like. Is when is jam, jam to catch an issue jam. Just is very, very tight, small, very tight. It's small because in the brain, it cannot be so big. There may be big. It's not large. It's small, very energy, thin layer, these things, because that frequently ruptures. In that malformations, that is called very energy, is frequent cause of severe subarachnoid hemorrhage. So it is important. Sarcolopolis. This is very always important this in circle of business. Actually, the, when you set a question for the PG students, MD also, we write this draw and describe circle of business and describe the incidence of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. So, circle of business, what is circle of business? Kiki Thake Konkun attribute to the Ekore Pharm Kore? Internal carotid, thakena. Dekho, just in the circle of willis, it acts up. Chobir moto jano thake. Kana active the short note jano na si UG PG always so many information. Just you remember. Actually, in regard to this very end region, I am discussing circle of willis because very end region occurs in these channels. So before that, where very end region is very common because rupture, you have to find if we send this frequently it happens. Very regions on the bush of Kutai, rupture. What are the positions of the very any regions? Where it frequently occurs. So that is you see these things. Just a sort of it is just anatomical knowledge. Again, it is very, very important when you have to exercise your medical knowledge to the court of law. You have to explain why the person died. It is not that a very any regions rupture hote pare, malle hote pare, or q regalo hote pare. Excitement may cause the very region. That is a very interesting thing. Actually, we got a case there so where the very young people, young persons, 35 persons uh, died and they accused that actually he was killed. 
by his lover. Actually, he was, the, he was uh, died in the lover south. So naturally, that is a very interesting case. So that time, it was a case of these things. Anyway, he, he, the, he is actually the, uh, not the person, for, because it was a natural cause. You see this here. Internal carotid artery. Then middle cerebral, why these things? Middle cerebral artery is this middle. But again, these things here meet two branches. That meet here at the basilar artery. There is vertebral artery, basilar artery. And that again, this posterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery. But very region occurs at the junctions very common. And where the blood force is maximum. So internal carotid artery pressure is definitely more, maximum. And so also the vertebral artery. So naturally, this most of the cases, why it is important to us actually, medically, why it is important? Because actually the commonest site is here. Because all the junctions, wherever two artery meets, there is always a turbulence of the pressure. turbulence. And malformations occurs generally at the junction. You see the vertebral, basilar artery, posterior cerebral artery, junction, shikane. middle cerebral artery, communicative artery, junction, shikane. or it's this anatomical knowledge, again, whatever these things, we are useful to the law because we have to explain our action. I mean, patient take a treatment with the pari me. I, I, I could not save the life of the patients. Or oh, I should have taken these actions to save the life, but I did not. So doctors are very vulnerable to the law because their main duty is to save the life of the patient. If they fail to do, if you are these things, if it is a lack of your knowledge and skill, you are responsible. You see, maximum, at a train accident, 200, 300 persons died, maximum person, maximum compensation allowed, 10 lakhs, 5 lakhs, sometimes 50 lakhs, maybe these things. Here, no limit. No limit. Even 12 course, 13 cores is being awarded. A, a simple thing is surgeon Arjikar, though no action was surgeons of Arjikar Medical College. He did a cholecystostomy, not the system, the stone removal by the, the, the laparoscopy. A person died, that person died after six months. So even in hospitals, so you know this uh, was accused of negligence and charged 56 lakhs rupees. For her negligence, yes, lady, for her negligence. That's why doctors are very, very vulnerable. Be careful. Whatever you do, these things, it may be acute after six months, after eight months, nine months, because ultimately on autopsy, after autopsy, it was found the gallstones in the abdomen. He could not see, could not remove all the gallstones, but still, still, that is not the thing. It is not a fact. It may happen. But why the gallstone? He did not remove, but he did not actually reveal it to the patient. We paroni, patient party ke bolo ni kano. Tarpori kyo chhe? That is the thing. Fifty six lakhs rupees actually charged upon him. Again, that is a case wrong case. So very very vulnerable. So you have to be very careful regarding this matter. I mean, kano paroni? Because very any regions thing is these things. It can rupture spontaneously without any trauma. Because why it's rupture? It is a malformation. Pressure to the body suddenly, there are hypertensive patients, old age patients. Achi, aneurysms is a congenital, it may develop later. Aneurysms generally are congenital malformation, generally, thin layers, gradually, gradually, that actually enlarges. Kintu, Kotrachi, Ekhani, Gulishlam. When, if upon heating, Jodim, Sita Marajai, Tokonamara will be homicide. Kista Havikin to Kun Korahoche, Mamara Korah. If it's spontaneously ruptured, that is excellent, that is natural. Again, another thing is this thing that most of the cases hypertensive patients. If I have the knowledge, suppose of my relatives, property never you know, have property I know my relatives, that maybe my parents, my fathers, or something like this. For the greed, these things, I knew the person is suffering from the aneurysms. That is diagnosed case. So I want to kill him. If I want to cause death, the some action I must do, I must take so that the persons get excited. You know this thing, rage, excitement, fear, increases pressure. Increases blood pressure, tachycardia occurs, heartbeat increases, 
and because of these things rupture and resumes of it. So, when came to charge that, because of this very sensitive, very sensitive one. So, naturally, that things, the knowing fully, if you have the knowledge and you cause death by just causing some fear, I mean, if you have our action, our talks, our behavior, that enraged the person, enraged my parents, and enraged my these things, and that aneurysm occur, and you will be charged of the holy side. So, that is the things, uh, remember, this is very, 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 very critical. You have to explain as far as your action. So, here, this very resume, uh, though undergraduate, only the MCQ comes this stage, not long questions, the MCQ comes, but it is very important information the positions of the individuals and what is the means of the individuals and for a father. This is often present with signs of the meningeal irritation, jeta bulletin, e high, headache, neck rigidity, photophobia, and deterioration of the unconsciousness. Ajuni gin to Sabaragnata Boyajaina, Ezeku, Idiesta, unconsciousness, concussion of the way. Headache into the produce, vision symptom produce. Ka. So some of these things, then that actually raises the questions, probably they are always severe. And that is also occurs in some disease conditions also. So naturally, you know, you know, photophobia, karmic signs, so high. Our blood found in lumbar puncture. The act is going to lumbar puncture, but it is going to be in the blood. That is the diagnostic, diagnostic criteria. So that is why the brain hemorrhage is going to be in the severe condition. Open one a bushy lumbar puncture put the high. Anatomical applied anatomy possible put it to the Kutha lumbar puncture, a pinta Kutha Jule spine in your other now? Which space? Hello? L3, L4. He said L3, L4. If I give the LT, L1, L2? Actually, it's actually. Ends generally L1, L2, but we give a little space because sometimes it may be a little more. But is that is the thing? L3, you are right. L3, L4. Here actually because spinal cord ends there. If you injure spinal cord, you know, say you are injuring the brain. So spinal cord here because this coda ayukuna starts. Then after this thing, coda ayukuna only can rough roots, but not the spinal cord. And spinal cord damage means permanent. But there is uh, no chance of the recovery, spinal cord. So you must not do the puncture to the spinal cord. So here, that is the thing, spinal disposition, cone spaces there. CSF is And CSF contains blood means subarachnoid hemorrhage. So these are the, at, at least, uh, I hope, uh, you, because this is anatomical knowledge. This is anatomical knowledge, only we are again, the too long, again, you advance this thing, the medicines, surgery, whatever you practice, the same things. Your anatomy and physiology knowledge, again, that will be sharpened on this test. Always, always. Nothing. Eta dekhena, shikani gurichi, comparative. EDH, HDH, SH. Subdural, subaragon. Differentiate. Eki differentiate to the thing. How we difference? Rather, it is intracranial hemorrhage. We can suspect. Tell me, some some points are there. These are the important points to just remember. You take note. Uh, you will not get it in any book. Uh, thing is this. Initially, some of the traumatic meningeal injury. Look, I am mean, also saying, also age, good basis hyperacute hemorrhage is commonest. The traumatic hemorrhage, which is hyperacute hemorrhage, most of the cases already include these things. It is mostly pathological, mostly traumatic and other things. Traumatic, pathological both occur. Because traumatic, maximum case, traumatic case is there, because commonest intracranial hemorrhage is cybercranial hemorrhage. Commonest hemorrhage. Cybercranial hemorrhage is maximum. Then subdural. Then EDH only because of trauma, but it is not common. In this sequence. So, what is the basic traumatic hemorrhage, subarachnoid, then subdural, then extradural. Epidural almost exclusively, just I mean, tabulated these things so that actually for your convenience, you just try to remember these things, this table, because actually that is stabilized. And subarachnoid mostly from disease and consequent upper trauma. Subarachnoid is high, 
বেরিয়ালি রিজনস পার্টিকুলারলি রাফ চাপ এগুলো যে ডিজিজ বেশিরভাগই ডিজিজই হয় ট্রমাটিক হতে পারে অন্য তো প্যাথোলজিক্যাল ডিজিজ কন্ডিশনস এগেইন দুটুতেই হতে পারে সাবারক্রান হেমারেজ কমনেস্ট ইন্টারক্রান হেমারেজই সাবারক্রান হেমারেজ এক্সটারিয়াল ব্লিডিং অলমোস্ট এক্সক্লুসিভলি আর্টেরিয়াল তাই তো আবারো বলেছিলাম মিডল মেনিনজিয়াল দ্য ব্রাঞ্চেস অফ দ্য মিডল মেনিনজিয়াল ফর অ্যান্টলাইজিস ইনস্টিটিউটি অ্যান্ড ট্রমা ইট ইজ আ থিনেস্ট বোন অ্যান্ড ট্রমা ইজ ফ্রিকোয়েন্টলি দ্যাট অকার অ্যান্ড দ্যাট কজেস ফ্র্যাকচারস অফ দ্য বোন অ্যান্ড ফ্র্যাকচার কজেস টিয়ার অফ দ্য আর্টারি অ্যান্ড দ্যাট ইজ দ্য অরিজিনস অফ দ্য ব্লাডস অ্যান্ড ইন দ্য সাবডুয়াল হেমারেজ দ্যাট ইজ ভেরি ক্লিয়ার সাবডুয়াল ব্লিডিং অলমোস্ট এক্সক্লুসিভলি ভেনাস তা সাবডুয়ালটা কি হয় ভেনাস আবারও বলছি ভেনাস চ্যানেল সাবডুয়াল আর সাবডুয়াল ব্লিডিং আর্টারি ভেনাস দিস ইনফরমেশন ইন ট্যাবুলেশন ফর্ম very important always you remember because mcq dates it is important uh ekhono ku contracop injury already bolechilam abar por cerebral hemorrhage when we discuss cerebral hemorrhage we discuss elaborately what is proof hemorrhage contract ku mane jekhane lagbe sekhane amar jodi frontal bone ami jodi mani front e forward e jodi hoy ekhane hemorrhage ta bolbe ku কিন্তু যদি হেমারেজ আবার পিছন সাইডে হয় তাকে বলবে কন্ট্রোল অপোজিট সাইড কেন হয় তার এটা মেকানিজমসটা অলরেডি উই শ্যাল এক্সপ্লেন লেটার অন ইন নেক্সট ক্লাস তাহলে কি আছে তাহলে এক্সটারোলাল এই যে ইনফরমেশনটা মনে রাখো আবার তখন বলবে এক্সটারোলাল হেমারেজ অলওয়েজ কুপ ইঞ্জুরি নো কন্ট্রাক ইঞ্জুরি সাব এরাকোনাইট সাবডুরাল কুপ কন্ট্রাক দুটোই হতে পারে লিউসিড ইন্টারভ্যাল ইডি এইচেই হয় এস ডি এইচ অ্যাকুট টাইপে কখনো কখনো হতে পারে মনে হয় বাট লুসিড ইন্টারভ্যাল ক্যারেক্টারিস্টিক লুসিড ইন্টারভ্যাল ইজ নট কমন ইজ কমন থার্টি ফাইভ দো এক্সটারুল হেমারেজ থার্টি ফাইভ পার্সেন্ট কেসেস অনলি এক্সটারুল হেমারেজ ইজ সো ইজ দ্য লুসিড ইন্টারভ্যাল বাট ইট ইজ এ ক্যারেক্টারিস্টিক লুসিড ইন্টারভ্যাল ইজ ক্যারেক্টারিস্টিক সাইন্স অফ দ্য এক্সট্রাডিউরাল হেমারেজ নট এস ডি এইচ নট এস এইচ ব্লাড ইন ইডি এইচ অল এইজ প্লটেড আমি ছবিগুলো দেখালাম সব সময় যখনই আমরা দেখেছি তখনই কিন্তু প্লটেড ব্লাড ডিসকয়েড সেপেজ অর গ্লোবেল হেলথ সেপেজ প্লটেড ব্লাড এস ডি এইচ ব্লাড প্লটেড আমরা দেখি না ভারতের অর্গানাইজড লিকুইড ইন অল দিস থিংস অ্যান্ড ইট ইজ স্প্রেড ওভার দ্য ব্রেন এ লার্জ স্পেস এস এইচ অলওয়েজ ফ্লুইড কারণ এস এইচ কখনো প্লটেড হয় না বিকজ ইট হোয়েন আফটার ডেট ইট মিক্সেস উইথ দ্য সি এস and rarely we get this thing there may be lot of bleedings that causes this thing even go to the ventricles and the ventricular hemorrhage all these things but always it's liquid that is a very important information to so remember these things that's why uh, lumbar puncture we get these things blood the ccc flows through these things any side wherever you find the cs ah fluid we say aaj ke next thing next that we have shesh korbo head injury লাস্ট ইজ সেরিব্রাল ইঞ্জুরি টুডে প্রবলি সেরিব্রাল ইঞ্জুরিটা হজম করতে পারবে না সেরিব্রাল ইঞ্জুরি আজকে থাক তো দিস থিং এ থিং রিক্যাপ ইজ দিস অলওয়েজ ট্রাই টু রিমেম্বার দ্য পয়েন্টস ইম্পর্টেন্ট পয়েন্টস বিকজ এগেন আই এম থিং দিস ইজ জাস্ট ডিউ কনসিডারেশন টু ইউর ফিউচার এক্সামস নেক্সট এক্সামস ইউ আর গোয়িং টু অ্যাপি এন্ড নেক্সট এক্সাম উইল বি নেক্সট ওয়ান উইল বি এমসিকিউ অ্যাজ দে সাজেস্টেড so mcq for mcq you must have the clear concrete specific information specific information not must to elaborate not must to describe not must to discuss but this thing information has to be specific and clear so to pass the next one so only the streaming to that i am just discussing all those points so next class cerebral will conclude with the cerebral injury and the medical legal information head injury for today actually this is enough blood group systems abo re are the main because they can cause incompatibility reactions otherwise there are kell duffy kid etc bombay is a variant where the h antigen is lacking have you had any class on blood grouping practical classes have you had any practical class on blood grouping compatibility testing what are transfused as blood components and 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 dengue 
and what are uh, blood derivatives do you know what are blood derivatives yes hemophilia a b factor 8 concentrate factor 9 concentrate apart from that albumin in patients of liver disease or in severely malnourished cataxic patients we need to transfuse albumin so these are blood derivatives a person donates whole blood and then it is centrifuged in very powerful machines and then the blood components are separated and what we are left with is the cryo precipitate from the cryo precipitate blood derivatives are obtained by pharma companies what they do is say reliance or any big pharma company they come to the blood banks they take the ffp or the cryo precipitate that is left and then they manufacture these drugs from the blood derivatives from the ffp or cryo precipitate okay indication of blood transfusion okay so it is actually very life saving blood component transfusion usually whole blood transfusion is not indicated there are very few indications where whole blood needs to be transfused it's usually blood component see a patient of severe anemia will need packed rbc it is the most common indication packed rbc apart from that platelets ffp they can be transfused and single immune transfusion has no meaning so when you in future become intern then you write how many blood required one does not have any meaning okay so if a patient you think a patient requires one unit of blood transfusion it is better to avoid that one unit of blood transfusion if a patient is severely anemic hemoglobin is way below 6 or something then you may transfuse two to three uh, when you think that a blood the patient cannot be saved without blood transfusion only then you need to transfuse blood because the adverse effects of blood transfusion are dire and they can be fatal so blood transfusion should be avoided if possible so the adverse effects of blood transfusion they can be immediate or they can be delayed can be immunological and non immunological apart from that say a patient uh, obstetric patient the very common indication is ectopic rupture the mother will come with severe hypertension and shock rapid fed plus unconscious there will be severe pallor the uh, skin will be uh, wet and uh, clammy skin any kind of shock the patient is going into and then we need to almost replace the whole volume of blood in the patient then that is called massive transfusion massive transfusion it comes with its own complications now immediate complications febrile non hemolytic transfusion reaction hemolytic transfusion reaction this is the most important apart from like most common also uh, allergic anaphylactic transfusion associated acute lung injury circulatory overload and bacterial contamination of donor unit uh, do you know what is febrile non hemolytic transfusion reaction uh, immediately after transfusion within a few hours or within a few minutes the patient will complain uh, of uh, hypo uh, of uh, uh, the patient will uh, develop temperature and will develop allergic reactions that is called febrile non hemolytic transfusion reaction the problem is hemolytic transfusion reaction and fnhtr they have the same presentation so when for a clinician differentiating between the two becomes difficult so whenever the patient complains of febrile non hemolytic transfusion reaction you have to rule out hemolytic transfusion reaction and you have to stop transfusion there is only one reason when an intern can lose the provisional registration number that they get i'm sure you know that is mismatched blood transfusion because of that clinician okay so you have to be very careful when you are transfusing and interns only transfuse blood so you have to be very careful now febrile non hemolytic transfusion reactions occurs because of some uh, say the donor blood they release some antibody the, the leukocytes in the donor blood release some uh, antibodies and these react with the leukocytes in the recipient and this causes some kind of complement activation 
and there is febrile non multi transmission reaction it also is common in uh, 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 patients of repeated transfusion say thalassemic patients they will complain of this what you have to do the management is slowly transfuse firstly you have to rule out hemolytic transfusion reaction and bacterial contamination these two you have to rule out and then you have to transfuse the blood very slowly the blood transfusion uh, should be say the blood is released from the blood bank the blood transfusion should commence within 30 minutes there is no concept of keeping a uh, blood bag in the refrigerator of the ward this is commonly done you go to the ward you will see especially in government hospitals lots of old blood is kept in the refrigerator there is no concept because the refrigerator in the ward is usually vibrates and that can that can cause hemolysis of the rbcs in the blood bag itself so you, it should commence within 30 minutes and should be stopped by four, like should be completed within four hours of release of blood from the blood bank. Okay, if the blood needs to be stored, if uh, say you don't need to transfuse, but you have requisitioned and the blood has been provided to the patient, then the blood should be kept in the blood bank itself because the blood bank has special refrigerators. These are called BBRs. The blood bank has these refrigerators which does not vibrate. That can store blood for a long time and the temperature is always checked in the blood bank because the maintaining the temperature for blood is also very important rbc has to be maintained in 2 to 6 degrees celsius platelet do you know what is the lifespan of platelet in uh, for transfusion yes 3 to 5 days in temperature now 25 to 30 platelet is kept warm in a platelet agitator it has to be kept under continuous agitation uh, for up to five days and platelet especially most commonly can get infected because it is being kept in a warmer temperature so can get infected by staphylococcus right so uh, for FNHTR you have to complete transfusion within four hours like you have to slowly transfuse complete transfusion within four hours and give some kind of antihistaminic to control the reaction next hemolytic transfusion reaction this is the most important and it can be fatal. In fact, I have seen whatever uh, cases of hemolytic transfusion reactions I have seen, I have always seen the patient dying. And then there was an investigation launched. You have to be very, very careful. So what happens is uh, donors, uh, RBC has some uh, antigens, the antibodies present in the recipient reacts with the donors RBC antigen. There is antigen antibody reaction complement activation complement activation gives rise to uh, complement cascade that can give rise to acute renal failure and there is hemolysis of blood hemolysis of rbcs leads to hemoglobin urea and uh, hemoglobinemia myoglobin urea acute renal failure apart from that there will be dic you will have dic class tomorrow i think so there will be DIC and there will be small clots in every organ, especially lung and then the patient will eventually die, go into shock, die. And it happens within a few hours and it is also dose dependent. So uh, the moment patient starts complaining, bhalo lachena, the patient will say that uh, I will feel loin pain, back pain because of renal failure, loin pain, back pain. Apart from that, there will be tachycardia and chest pain and breathlessness. When the patient complains of all this, you have to stop transfusion immediately and inform the clinician, the concerned doctor, you have to inform. And you have to also inform the blood bank. The investigation has to start by the first respondent. And obviously, you start giving anti antihistaminics. You stop the transfusion, take out the blood. But you maintain the channel by putting in saline. You maintain the line and you collect venous blood in EDTA and clot vials, red vial and violet, purple vial. You co uh, collect blood and first pass urine of the patient. Right? Why are you doing all this? Okay? Huh. 
urinary hematuria acute renal failure and apart from that uh, there is the blood you are uh, edta blood you are collecting so that you can repeat cross match you will repeat do the R abo and rh typing in the blood in the pre transfusion blood and the post transfusion blood and apart from that cross match of the pre transfusion sample post transfusion sample with the donor sample right these are the complications i have already explained vasodilation hypotension shock renal failure there will be uh, in because of hemolysis there will be increased bilirubin increased ldh disseminated intravascular coagulation now diagnosis of intravascular hemolysis it the edta sample will show pink color of plasma apart from that there will be spherocytes and fragmented rbcs in the peripheral smear hemoglobin urea reduced haptoglobin in blood and in, increased indirect serum bilirubin in blood now for uh, demonstration of blood group incompatibility uh there will you have to do uh, abo and rh typing i have already explained this and direct anti globulin test or coombs test it's basically coombs test you have to perform in the pre transfusion and post transfusion sample that your egta sample that you have collected if there is negative dat in the pre transfusion sample and positive dat in the post transfusion sample what does that mean all the students who think this lecture is not important what does it mean negative in pre transfusion coombs test negative in pre transfusion sample and coombs test positive in post transfusion sample what does that mean abo incompatibility has happened right so the most common cause of abo incompatibility is clerical error most commonly in 90% cases it is clerical error who is the clerk here intern the intern is the clerk here not the blood bank so the intern may have collected the sample from a wrong patient may have labeled the vial wrong or may have filled up the requisition the blood for requisition form that may have been filled wrong and sent to the blood bank there can be mismatch in the blood bank as well and that is why the blood bank needs to be informed because another blood bank might be involved they may have sent the wrong blood bank for this patient another wrong blood bank will be sent to another patient so they also have to be informed so that this can be prevented other investigations are test for dic and that is coagulation screening fibrin degradation products platelet count for renal failure creatinine blood urea and the tests in donor unit now what is transfusion of associated acute lung injury the now some leukoagglutinins are present in the donor unit which causes aggregation of leukocytes in the recipient leukoagglutinins in the donor unit is causing aggregation of leukocytes in the recipient this causes small uh, aggregates of leukocytes which can go and lodge in the small vessels of the pulmonary circulation which leads to pulmonary edema and diffuse infiltrates in the lung like this this was the pre transfusion x ray and the post transfusion x ray you can see it is hazy and there are diffuse infiltrates all over the lung field right so in this case uh, you have to stop transfusion and manage conservatively you have to manage the patient apart from that there can be allergic reaction this is caused by ige of the recipient it reacts with the donor units donor antibodies the ige reacts and there can be allergic reaction you have to give some antihistaminics and stop the transfusion 
Apart from that, there can be anaphylactic reaction. Anaphylactic reaction occurs especially can be fatal in patients who have less IgA in their, the recipients who have less IgA. Antibodies against IgA in, is present in some recipients, which is there is so IgA in this recipient is already low, but the donor IgA is present. So the antibodies uh, of the recipient reacts with the donor IgA and it can cause fetal anaphylactic reaction. In anaphylactic reaction, it will again be same like hemolytic transfusion reaction or FNHTR, but fever will not be present and you have to give steroids. Immediately stop transfusion and give steroids. Bacterial contamination of donor unit, again, this is also important. It can occur uh, during blood collection if the venipuncture site was not sterilized properly. So the skin bacteria can get into the donor unit and this will proliferate in the donor unit and can cause uh, infection and uh, exotoxinemia, endotoxinemia in the recipient. Apart from that, for platelets, I already told you because platelets are stored at 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. So, um, the platelets itself, they can, uh, there can be growth of staphylococcus in the platelet units that you are transfusing. Apart from that, there can be asymptomatic bacteremia in the donor. This is usually caused by Yersinia enterocolitica. Okay. So there can be asymptomatic bacteremia in the donor, which blood when transfused to the recipient can cause infection. So how do you know that uh, the blood bag was contaminated? Can you know by looking at it? There might be hemolysis in the blood bag. So you have to, before transfusing, you have to hold the blood bag, especially the PRBC bags. You have to hold it in front of your eyes. If you see any discoloration, there is blackish discoloration or the plasma that is present is showing some color change, then don't transfuse the blood. The blood bank personally should not be providing that kind of blood to the patient. But if the blood bank does provide, you are the one who is transfusing, you will be signing the, the a note for transfusion. There is always a note for transfusion. You will be signing that. It is your responsibility. So you must check before transfusing. Apart from that, uh, the blood bag, it, has, it is made of plastic. So there can be tiny breaks in the plastic. External uh, environmental bacteria can get into the blood bag. Apart from that, if the now, do you know what temperature SSP and cryo precipitate is stored at? Hmm? Minus 25, less than minus 25 for one year. Usually minus 30, minus 40. So, now then it is thawed. It is thawed at 30 degrees Celsius. It is thawed in the blood bank. And after thawing, it has to be transfused within... 24 hours, FFP and cryoprecipitate. So if there is rapid thawing in higher temperature or in water bath, that can lead to uh, infection in the FFP or cryoprecipitate unit. And when that is transfused, can give rise to infection. Now, patients who receive FFP and cryoprecipitate, they are usually debilitated patients, you know. Liver disease patients or cancer patients, they are giving, given FFP. So they are more prone to this kind of infection. Now, delayed complication, it is again hemolytic transfusion reaction, but the magnitude is not as much as acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. Delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction, the cross match may have been okay in the blood bank, but there are the recipient may have been sensitized. Uh, in a previous transfusion or she is a multiparous woman and, and she was previously trans, uh, sensitized from the fetus. Now when she or when that patient receives transfusion, there can be delayed reaction which appears about uh, 3 to 5 days after transfusion. It will also present with fever and restlessness and all but the magnitude will not be that much. Post-transfusion purpura. This happens in multiparous women 
Now they are previously sensitized by some antigens against platelet. Now when this patient receives transfusion, the somehow the antibodies against the platelet reacts with the patient's own platelets. And there is purpura, thrombocytopenia and purpura, it can be fatal. Did you understand? Some antibodies against platelets are present in a patient, usually a multiparous woman. Why a multiparous woman? The fetus may have, there, there can be some overlap, there can be some uh, fetal, maternal and fetal blood may have interchanged and the mother is usually sensitized. And in that case, the mother's own plate antibodies against platelet will react with the mother's own platelet and there will be thrombocytopenia purpura. It is fatal, needs to be treated with steroids. And in case of delayed complications, the most important are transfusion transmitted infection. Okay, now, uh, no matter how careful, no matter how high standards a blood bank is maintaining, there, can, there is always a risk of TPI and the blood bank, it is, may not be the fault of the blood bank. The blood bank, it is um, usually recommended that they test for, it is from the government of India, it is recommended that six t uh, infections be tested in every donor unit. That means without consent of the donor, six infections which are endemic or prevalent in this population are tested. Those six infections are hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV 1, HIV 2, syphilis, malaria. These are the six infections. Usually it is recommended that they be tested by ELISA. Uh, but many a times they do the CART testing, rapid CART testing. So that, that risk is always there. Apart from that, uh, there are many trans, uh, infections that can be transmitted. So this is the list. Do you think that even after testing for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, the recipient may develop this infection, especially in uh, cases of patients who receive multiple transfusions, say thalassemia patients or any other patients who receives multiple transfusion. Why do you think when you go to the ward, you will realize that you have to uh, treat those patients with utmost care, as in when you collect blood from those patients, you must wear gloves so that you yourself are not infected. Okay. So why do you think in spite of testing for these TTIs, the donor unit may have these infections. Why? Have these viruses been taught in micro? Because there is a long latent period for these infections and there, there is a window before the infections become, uh, the, they express antigens which are uh, detectable by our ELISA and CAR testing. So if the patient is in a window period, the, the, uh, the, if the donor is in a window period, it will not be detected by our common tests. In that case, PCR, etc. is required, which is not done. So if the donor is in the window period of HIV, HBV, HCV, then you, it will not be detected and the recipient will receive these infections. What is the most common route of, trans, uh, of uh, infection by HCV? Most common route, treponema pallidum does not survive in blood for more than five days. So the risk is only there if there is platelet transfusion or immediately after the donor is giving the blood, you are transfusing the blood, only then a syphilis transfu uh, transfusion can happen and malaria is endemic. Malaria parasite is not tested for mal malaria parasite detection is done by, do you know how malaria parasite detection is done? Malaria which is? Malaria parasite detection is done by microscopy. Now microscopy is not, microscopic test for malaria detection is not done for every donor, not possible. So that much manpower we do not have. So malaria transfusion can happen. 
when you are donating blood uh how do you prevent tti's how do you prevent prevention of tti meticulous testing of course apart from that meticulous history taking who takes the history the medical officer who is collecting the blood takes the history of the donor so it is your responsibility to take the history there is something called professional blood donor have you heard of professional blood donor all this goes on when you grow up you will understand so there are some uh, people who in exchange for money frequently donate blood yes it goes on and if their blood group is rare they get a lot of money for that now blood donation it is called donation you do not get any money for donating blood but some unscrupulous people are there you will not come to know how will you detect who is the professional donor it's not possible but you have to take the history meticulously you have to observe the patient whether the patient is giving any signs of being a professional donor apart from that you have to know the occupation of the patient why why is the occupation important Hmm? How is HIV transmitted usually? Yes. So, if, we, if there are a truck driver who goes to Mumbai frequently, or some other place, or you know any other profession which can be associated with STD, the, those things you have to rule out. iron overload it is a complication in uh, recipients of frequent blood transfusion now excretion of iron what is the normal rate of excretion of iron 1 mg per day right and each unit contains 200 mg so there is a huge iron overload because of multiple transfusions there is huge iron overload so desferi oxamine iron chelation therapy should be constituted early in these patients to prevent the complications of iron overload what is the complication of iron overload chromatosis na so uh, this is called secondary hemochromatosis and it can accumulate in the heart in the liver or in the endocrine organs if it accumulates in the endocrine organs there can be growth retardation in the liver there can be cirrhosis and hemochromatosis is also associated with hcc hepatocellular carcinoma uh, in heart there can be amyloidosis and there can be failure now massive blood transfusion massive blood transfusion i have already explained it is when there is a massive road traffic accident or again obstetric complication like tph or ectopic pregnancy in these cases uncontrolled hemorrhage occurs I and mean, if you see an a patient of ectopic pregnancy you will be stunned so uncontrolled hemorrhage occurs and the whole volume of the blood of the patient may need to be re replaced by transfusion in that case what happens is the blood is stored now the coagulation factors are present in the blood for only a few days right so the blood that is transfused is lacks coagulation factor so now the patient since the whole volume is being replaced now the patient or the recipient has blood which lacks in coagulation factors especially factor 5 and factor 8 and there is loss of platelet function apart from that there can be hyperkalemia because of some lysed rbcs there can be hyperkalemia hypocalcemia because of the anticoagulant which is pre present in the blood bag okay anticoagulant which is present in the blood bag acts by chelation of calcium that is how the anticoagulant function so this anticoagulant can cause hypocalcemia in the recipient 
apart from that hypothermia because you are transfusing a lot of blood fast so the blood is kept at 2 to 6 degrees celsius now the blood is cold you must keep the blood out of the refrigerator and let it come to normal temperature for at least 30 minutes now this blood is very cold you are transfusing it to the recipient and then there can be hypothermia and complications of hypothermia like cardiac arrhythmia apart from that there can be uh, some amount of platelet and leukocytes form aggregates in the donor blood. It is always present. It does not matter when you are transfusing say two units. But when you are doing massive blood transfusion, these can go and aggregate in the small vessels of the pulmonary circulation which can lead to ARDS. This blood transfusion, uh, it is when the patient's own blood is being collected and transfused back to the patient. What is the advantage? What look of blood transfusion is the frequent short note? What is the advantage? No risk of incompatibility reaction and No risk of incompatibility reaction, no risk of allergic reaction, no risk of TTIs. So that is why autologous blood transfusion is advantageous. Uh, apart from that, some patients may have some rare blood groups. The RBCs in these uh, patients express some rare antigens which is not usually found in donors or in the general population. In these cases, autologous blood transfusion is also preferred. In these cases, blood is collected from these patients and stored for a long time. Now, there are three methods of autologous blood transfusion. Pre-deposit or pre-operative blood donation, acute normovolemic hemodilution and blood salvage. Now, pre-deposit or pre-operative blood donation. In this case, this is done when there is a planned or elective surgery which the patient is undergoing. At least seven days prior to that planned elective surgery, the patient goes to the blood bank and donates his own blood and it is kept for him only. And in this case, there are some prerequisites. The patient must be living close to the blood bank. The patient cannot travel a very long distance every day. His or her blood uh, hemoglobin level should be more than 11. It is done usually when you expect that there will be a lot of blood loss during the elective surgery so that you know for sure that blood transfusion will be required, especially for orthopedic surgery. They always require blood transfusion. And uh, you know that the patient uh, does not have any cardiac disease or any cardiopulmonary disease. Apart from that, you know that the patient is not suffering from any TTI. Why? Why is it important that the patient not suffer from any TTI? Because frequent mix-ups happen in the blood bank. So, inadvertently, this blood may be transfused to another recipient. So, it is important that the patient be not suffering from any TTIs. Apart from that, you have to rule out that the uh, patient is, does not have any infection or bacteremia at the time of blood donation for himself only because this bacteria can proliferate in the donated blood unit and then cause severe bacteremia when it is repeated, when it is transfused back to the patient. This is pre-operative blood donation. Acute normovolemic hemodilution. In this case, before surgery, in a patient who is stable, cardiopulmonary st stable patient, you collect a, 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 say one to two units of blood from that patient and it is kept in the blood bag within the OT near to the patient. And then uh, crystalloids or colloids are given to the patient. What is crystalloid? What is colloid? Hmm? 
normal saline are the crystalloids and what are the colloids dextrose so crystalloids or colloids to maintain the volume of the blood crystalloids or colloids are given to the patient and the uh, rbcs are the blood is kept within the ot near to the patient it is kept at room temperature only or whatever the ot's temperature is it is maintained at that temperature no need to refrigerate this blood no need to take it to the blood bank and after surgery this blood is uh, returned back to the patient this is done when you again expect that there will be a lot of surgical blood loss say knee replacement uh, surgery or say in cardiac surgery patients this can be done but you have to uh, first ensure that the patient can tolerate the reduced oxygenation of blood during surgery at that time and blood salvage this uh, i don't know if it's done here it has i have never heard of blood salvage being done in a government hospital in west bengal what is done is say there is massive blood loss during surgery again the surgeries are cardiac surgery tkr or say ectopic rupture in those cases the blood is collected from the ot site it is collected and then it is clean how is it clean it is centrifuge it is anti coagulated it is washed it the it is filtered to uh, say there is any debris or any uh, aggregates of platelets and leukocytes may have formed these are filtered and then it is again suspended in normal saline and then transfused back to the patient this is called blood salvage in this case you have to ensure that the blood is not contaminated by stool or by urine that is there is no intestinal rupture or urethral rupture or by amniotic fluid in case of ectopic you have to ensure that there is no mix with amniotic fluid or there is no infection in that blood it has to be a clean surgical site from there blood salvage is done and then that blood is transfused back to the patient now advantages of autologous transfusion i have already explained avoids transmission of infectious organisms avoids immunologic complications associated with homologous transfusion reduces need for blood from homologous donors avoids problem of finding compatible blood for a patient with a rare blood group or multiple red cell antibodies uh, an another thing that can happen in uh, acute uh, immunological is graft versus host disease do you know what is graft versus host disease i forgot to mention graft versus host disease usually heard in kidney transplant liver transplant it can happen for blood donation also it usually occurs in patients say of leukemia or say any plasma cell dyspepsia where before uh, bone marrow transplant the patient is planned for bone marrow transplant the patient is irradiated and patient goes into bone marrow suppression okay this is the how it is bone marrow transplant is done by that method first the patient is irradiated and kept in a very closed box like situation so that uh, because at that time the patient uh, uh, is medically induced to bone marrow suppression so very prone the patient becomes very prone to infections so kept in a closed box like situation now in these cases there can be anemia and may need transfusion in these patients there can be graft versus host disease apart from that say a first degree relative donates blood in that case also there can be graft versus host disease graft versus host disease is caused by the donor lymphocyte they react against the blood and then there is blood graft versus host disease and manifestations are uh, in liver say there can be hepatitis or there can be bone marrow suppression apart from that there can be vomiting there can be jaundice there can be fever these are the symptoms chronic obstructive pulmonary disease that is copd these are both inflammatory disorder of the bronchial airways now bronchial asthma is a basically reversible inflammatory disorder of the bronchial airways 
while COPD is the chronic irreversible inflammatory disorder of the bronchial airways. Now what happens in bronchial asthma is a chronic inflammatory disease where there are reversible episodes of uh, respiratory distress that is basically airway obstruction. How it is caused? This is caused because of bronchial hyper responsiveness to the allergen or any precipitating factor. Now, uh, although the condition of bronchial asthma is reversible, but repeated episodes in later stage can turn the disease to irreversible one. In early phase, the bronchial asthma basically the exacerbation it causes smooth muscle spasm causing bronchoconstriction. But later on, as the disease, at the as the exacerbation proceeds, there is excessive secretion of the mucus. Even that can cause mucus flux that can block the bronchi and bronchioles worsening the attack. In late phase, the inflammation continues, causing fibrosis, edema of the bronchial airways, and necrosis. That ah, sorry, come hmm. and necrosis of the bronchial epithelial cells that turns the disease into an irreversible one. Now the cardinal symptoms of the bronchial asthma are breathlessness, wheezing, wheezing is the musical sound coming out during respiration, cough and the chest tightness. These symptoms are more pronounced at night, why? Because the parasympathetic tone which causes bronchoconstriction is more at the night. So many of the bronchial asthma exacerbation they are they occurs at night coming to the uh, basically the uh, pulmonary function parameters in ex exacerbation of in bronchial asthma patients the peak expiratory flow rate force expiratory volume in first second and mid maximal expiratory flow rate these are all reduced but the gold standard for the diagnosis of the bronchial asthma is fev1 that is force expiratory volume in first second. Now in bronchial asthma patients during exacerbations what happens about the arterial blood gas levels? The partial pressure of oxygen is reduced, there is bronchoconstriction, so uh, decreased oxygen getting into the lung causing decrease in the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. But carbon dioxide level partial pressure is maintained in the arterial blood, why? because the patient start hyperventilating during the exacerbation episode and that causes the carbon dioxide wash out in the body. So the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is maintained or may even go down in exacerbation due to hyperventilation. But in the advanced stage of exacerbation due to persistent uh, uh, bronchoconstriction, the carbon dioxide is start to retain and so at last the finally the partial pressure of carbon dioxide they start to increase. So if a person of bronchial asthma exacerbation if it is found the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is increased that means it is a serious attack life threatening attack. Now types of bronchial asthma, bronchial asthma can be broadly of two types one is extrinsic asthma and the another one is intrinsic asthma. What do you mean by extrinsic or intrinsic asthma? In extrinsic asthma, there will be a precipitating factor, maybe an allergen or a chemical irritants. So there is a presence of a precipitating factor, mostly allergen, like pollen or a house dust mite. Extrinsic asthma is episodic. Why? Because it exaggerates only on the presence of an allergen. So it is mostly episodic. And they are, this type of patients, patients of extrinsic asthma, they are lesser prone to develop status asthmaticus. Now what do we mean by status asthmaticus? Status asthmaticus is the acute, come in, huh? status asthmaticus is the acute life threatening episode of bronchial asthma exacerbation. Now intrinsic asthma on the other side they do not have any precipitating factor like allergen or any non-specific irritant. These are perennial, round the year they may occur, while the extrinsic asthma they are episodic. 
Now, intrinsic asthma patients, they are more prone to develop status asthmaticus. Extrinsic asthma can be again of two types. It can be atopic, it can be non-atopic. Now, what do we mean by atopic asthma? There is a presence of a specific allergen or a factor that causes exacerbation of bronchial asthma. Now, in case of non-atopic one, uh, a specific allergen or factor is not there. It can be due to the presence of a chemical irritant or the house fumes. Status asthmaticus, as discussed, discussed, it is a severe, acute, life-threatening episode of exacerbation of bronchial asthma. The cardinal features are severe breathlessness. Patient is not able to complete even a sentence. Exhaustion. Patient is fatigued. Patient may be cyanosed, hypoxic. In the initial phase, there may be severe tachycardia, but in advanced phase, bradycardia ensues. The patient may develop hypotension, metabolic alkalosis, dehydration. Now, what do we mean by again the term cardiac asthma? As the term suggests cardiac, it is related to cardiac origin. When a bronchospasm is precipitated by uncompensated congestive heart failure coming, it is called cardiac asthma. That is not related to bronchial asthma, not related to COPD. Pathogenesis of bronchial asthma. In the classical model of bronchial asthma, there is an allergen. When the person is exposed to allergen, the body synthesizes first IgE antibody. Now, this IgE antibody, they either circulate in the blood or they get attached to the mast cell of the lung or the nasal mucosa or in the basophils. Now, when the patient is again exposed to the same allergen or the same precipitating factor, what happens? There is a formation of IgE antigen complex. Now, uh, on the surface of this antigen antibody reaction uh, occurs that causes degranulation of the mast cells. So, inflammatory mediators are released. These are this this uh, this, uh, this compose this is composed of histamine, serotonin, prostaglandin D2, and very important cystinyl leukotrienes (LTC4 and LTD4). These are very important chemical mediator of bronchial asthma. Now, uh, due to the release of these, basically uh, in inflammatory mediators, the bronchial airway inflammation continues. Gradually, there is uh, increased secretion of mucus in the bronchial mucosa and due to this inflammation, the mass cells further releases inflammatory mediators which include LTB4, leukotriene B4 and they also begins to recruit other inflammatory cells that include eosinophils, neutrophils and other leukocytes. Now, what happens? This eosinophils and thus further chronic inflammation, thus further inflammation continues. Eosinophil, they secrete special, specifically eosinophilic cationic protein, ECP, and eosinophil derived neurotoxin factor. What does they cause? They cause shedding of the bronchial epithelial cells. Now, due to this shedding of the bronchial epithelial cells, the irritant fibers and the C fibers, they are exposed. And so, they are now more reactive to the uh, allergen or the precipitating factor. And that is the basis for bronchial hyperresponsiveness to the chemical stimuli. Now, coming to this, this is a bronchial epithelial cells, the bronchial smooth muscle cell. Now, the tone of bronchial smooth muscles, they are maintained by sympathetic system, parasympathetic system and also non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic system. Along with that, adenosine also plays a role in the maintenance of bronchial smooth muscle tone. Adenosine, they cause bronchoconstriction by acting on A1 and A3 receptor. Now, coming to the parasympathetic system, they basically stimulate M3 receptor. And this M3 receptor causes increased formation of cyclic GMP. And thus, there is bronchodilatation. 
the uh, basically sympathetic system the problem is that there is very less innervation of sympathetic system in the bronchial smooth muscle the sympathetic system they innervate basically more bronchial vessels causing vasodilatation uh, but uh, the innervation in the bronchial uh, smooth muscle they are very sparse so how does the sympathetic tone is maintained maintained by the circulating catecholamines what does it cause there is beta 2 receptors in the bronchial smooth muscles and by the stimulation of beta 2 receptor there is increased formation of cyclic amp and that is basically causing bronco uh, bronchodilatation now again among the non adrenergic non cholinergic system nitric oxide is the inhibitory uh, uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter uh, they cause bronchodilatation by increased formation of cyclic gmp and the uh, excitatory ones are substance p and neurokinins now the more important thing is today say that although the histamine re is released as a chemical mediator in the pathogenesis of bronchial asthma but is not an important mediator of human asthma the important ones are leukotriene b4 uh, D, c4 d4 therefore antihistaminics are not used for the treatment of asthma they are not effective while leukotrienes and interleukin 4 interleukin 5 these are the important mediators of acute asthma and so leukotriene antagonists are useful in treatment drugs used for bronchial asthma we can divide the drugs into broadly two categories one is bronchodilators where their primary role is to dilate the bronchial smooth muscles and the other one is basically they are used for prophylaxis of bronchial asthma by their anti inflammatory action they decrease the inflammation bronchodilators are selective beta 2 agonist which include Uh, short acting ones and long acting beta 2 agonists short acting salbutamol and terbutaline these are the more important uh, these are mainly clinically used there are also lib albuterol or levosalbutamol remeterol phenoterol perbuterol long acting beta 2 agonists salmeterol pomoterol are more commonly used these are long acting ones and the ultra long acting ones are indacaterol uh, basically action around 24 hours olodaterol vilanterol non selective sympathomimetics as the name suggest they not only act on beta 2 receptors they also act on other receptors other beta receptors or maybe alpha receptors they include epinephrine or adrenaline ephedrine isoprenaline or ciprenaline anticholinergics they include short acting muscarinic antagonist and long acting muscarinic antagonist short acting ones are if, uh, please uh, in the exam don't write the short forms hmm. short acting muscarinic antagonists are ipratropium bromide and oxytropium and long acting muscarinic antagonists are tiotropium oxytropium glycopyronium uh, right it's not oxytropium oxytropium is short acting ones long acting ones are tiotropium glycopyronium aclidinium eumeclidinium methylxanthines they include theophylline aminophylline doxophylline diprofylline and choline theophylinate coming to uh, the other group of drugs which decreases the inflammation or used as prophylaxis of bronchial asthma these are corticosteroids they can be used by oral route parenteral route inhalational route oral route is prednisolone prednisone methylprednisone methyl prednisolone dexamethasone beta methasone parenteral ones are hydrocortisone methyl prednisolone inhalational ones are diclomethasone budesonide cyclosonide fluticasone triamcinolone mometasone mast cell stabilizers they decrease the degranulation of the mast cell sodium chromoglycate ketotifen and nidocromin leukotriene modulators basically either they decrease the synthesis of leukotrienes these are basically life five lipoxygenase inhibitor diluton or uh, they can be leukotriene receptor antagonist montelukast more commonly clinically used japilukast iralukast pranlukast monoclonal ige antibody omalizumab and 
the miscellaneous or the newer bronchial asthma drugs these are benralizumab tegipelumab nepolizumab dupilumab and others now acute attack of asthma is reversible reversible by the use of bronchodilator but the problem is that the inflammation that is going on in the bronchial asthma patient during exacerbation they are not reversed by the use of bronchodilator there comes a role of prophylactic therapy so acute attack of asthma is reversible by using bronchodilator however underlying pathological changes continue mainly in adults what changes inflammatory changes preventing asthmatic attack is rewarding in preventing gradual damage to the alveoli each attack of bronchial asthma they cause some damage to the alveoli and they are, if they are repeated episodes gradually the alveoli get damaged so to prevent asthmatic attack is more helpful than to reverse the attack now coming to sympathomimetics sympathomimetics basically the action is on beta 2 receptor that increases the cyclic amp level and thus was thus cause bronchodilatation again the inflammatory cells including mast cells they also have got beta 2 receptors and by acting on those receptors also they decrease the release of the inflammatory mediators so by this action they are also decreasing the inflammation but the problem is that the beta 2 receptors in the mast cells or other inflammatory cells they desensitize quickly they desensitize quickly to the action of beta 2 agonist so on repeated use of drug basically the action of this uh, beta 2 agonist on the inflammatory cells are not there it fade away but in case of bronchial muscle cells they do not the beta 2 receptors on them they do not see desensitize so even if the drug is repeatedly used the action persists adrenergic drugs are the main stay of the treatment in bronchial asthma patients why because uh, because of reversibility but should be used cautiously in hypertensive ischemic heart disease or arrhythmia patients why because of the beta 1 action all the drugs they are not uh, uh, purely selective some beta 1 action is there so they should be used cautiously in hypertensive ischemic heart disease or those receiving digitalis the beta 2 agonists are the most effective and the fastest acting bronchodilator and the most safe one if they used as by inhalational route non selective sympathomimetics because of their non selective action that is cardiac stimulant action what does they cause tachycardia may cause increase in blood pressure worsening of angina and may even precipitate arrhythmia so their use has been declined with the advent of uh, selective beta 2 agonists they are not used nowadays but in a patient of at the epinephrine and isoprenaline they are used initially by inhalation route before the advent of uh, selective beta 2 agonists now epinephrine may sometimes be used in patient of status asthmaticus by subcutaneous route why the pulmonary blood vessels they have got as alpha receptors epinephrine by acting there on the alpha receptors of the pulmonary vasculature they call pulmonary vasoconstriction so pulmonary edema is reduced so they are helpful in patient of status asthmaticus metaprotrenal or orciprenaline is a long acting derivative of isoprenaline they have got more prominent beta 2 action due to decrease with the advent of the Uh, select, selective beta 2 agonist ephedrine problem is slow onset cns stimulant action so not used selective beta 2 agonist ministry of therapy bronchodilator therapy they can be short acting they can be long acting short acting ones are salbutamol terbutaline long acting like formoterol salmeterol now mechanism of action of selective beta 2 agonist two i said earlier only they cause bronchodilatation by acting at beta 2 receptors on the bronchial ischemic muscle thus they increase cyclic amp level and cause bronchodilatation second one i said the the, the beta 2 receptors are also located on the mast cells and other inflammatory cells they are the beta 2 agonists act they decrease the inflammatory mediator release 
and thus they are effective in uh, bronchial asthma. They also inhibit microvascular leakage and increase the mucociliary transport. As said earlier, beta 2 receptors on the inflammatory cells, they desensitize quickly, thus on prolonged use, this effect is lost and due to this reason they are not useful for the prevention of acute attack of bronchial asthma. But desensitization of the beta 2 receptors on the bron bronchial smooth muscle, they do not occur. So, on even repeated use, the bronchodilator effect is maintained. Short acting beta 2 agonist, these are fa faster onset of action, most effective in, the re in reversing bronchoconstriction. They are preferred in symptomatic relief of acute attack of asthma, only symptomatic relief not in prophylaxis. Both salbutamol and terbutalin are most commonly used. Salbutamol they have got highest beta 2 selectivity and are selectively further increased on inhalation route. By inhalation onset of action is just 5 minutes and the action persists for 3 to 6 hours. When we give it by oral route by availability 50 percent duration of action 4 to 8 hours. Now they are not suitable for prophylaxis. Side effect. Side effects are because of beta 1 receptor stimulation, it can be tremor, palpitation, tachycardia, restlessness and even hypokalemia. Terbutaline is similar to salbutamol, but the, uh, it is perhaps the only bronchodilator which can be safely used in pregnancy. These are highly lipid soluble, so they bind to the beta 2 receptors, cannot easily dissociate from it, so the action is long. Now onset of action is slow. Onset of action is slow and the action is time of action is long except in case of formoterol. In case of formoterol, the onset of action is fast like that of short acting beta 2 agonist and the action and the action persists for long time. It is for this reason the formoterol and ICA that is inhalational corticosteroids they can be taken for both the purpose to relieve the acute attack of asthma and to control the acute attack of asthma because the action is uh, basically action is quick and persists for a longer time. They do not treat the underlying chronic inflammation as earlier said huh, in asthma and they may even increase the risk of exacerbation of life threatening asthma. With every attack of asthma some damage to the alveoli occurs. If the patient is only given, if the patient is only given the beta 2 agonist, what happens every time some damage to the alveoli is occurring and at, at, at patient is more prone to the life threatening asthma attack. So they should never be used alone in bronchial asthma patient. In bronchial asthma patient long acting beta 2 agonists should never be used alone. They should always be combined with inhalational corticosteroids. As fixed dose combination, when asthma is not controlled with low dose inhalational corticosteroids, addition of long acting ones is more effective than increasing the dose of inhalation corticosteroids. In fact, in the treatment management of the bronchial asthma, initially in the milder case, first of all we give only low dose inhalation corticosteroids. And when the uh, frequencies increase, then we add up the long acting beta 2 agonists. There can uh, long acting beta 2 agonists can also be used in combination with anti muscarinics. Both salmeterol and formoterol inhibit late uh, phase allergen induced asthma because they are long action. Uh, <coughs> now coming to methyl xanthines. Methyl xanthines basically they are plant products three in number caffeine, theophylline and theobromine. But theobromine action is very weak so they are not using clinical therapeutics. We are more concerned with caffeine, caffeine particularly in case of migraine and theophylline in bronchodilatation. Sources tea leaves, mainly caffeine and a small amount of theophylline, theobromine, cocoa and chocolate, theobromine mainly, coffee seeds and cola drinks, caffeine. Pharmacological actions, in the central nervous system, stimulant action, they allay fatigue, sense of well-being, alertness, improves concentration and performance, higher doses, nervousness, palpitation, restlessness, panic, insomnia, even at higher doses, tremor, delirium, conversion. The stimulant action is more with caffeine and the toxicity is more with theophylline, vomiting at higher doses. 
cardiovascular system in uh, more chronotropic and inotropic effect so positive so they increase the heart rate they increase the contractility now action of action on the heart rate it is increased due to direct cardiac action but it may be decreased due to vagal stimulation so the effect is variable at higher doses patient may even uh, pre, uh, develop arrhythmia the action on blood pressure again is variable it may be increased due to ca direct cardiac action and by the action on the vasomotor center it can be decreased with uh, basically cardiac uh, uh, vagal stimulation and also by vasodilatation because they uh, they act on beta 2 receptors usually a rise in systolic blood pressure and fall in diastolic blood pressure occurs now they dilate systemic blood vessels including coronaries except cranial vessels and cranial vessels particularly with caffeine so in a patient with acute attack of migraine where the primary pathology is cranial vessel vasodilatation caffeine finds a role this smooth muscle relaxes more prominent effect on the bronchi kidney mild diuresis skeletal muscle enhances contractile power theobromine uh, theophylline they enhance diaphragmatic contractility and so they are useful uh, in dyspnea patient with COPD or asthma, COPD sorry, stomach they enhance acid and pepsin secretion. So they are basically castric irritant, increase basal metabolic rate and they also like that of beta 2 agonist, they decrease the release of inflammatory mediators from the inflammatory cells. Mechanism of action, there are four mechanisms of action. The first one very important inhibition of phosphodiesterase enzyme. There are 11 subtypes of phosphodiesterase enzyme of which PDE4, phosphodiesterase 4 isoenzyme, they are present in the bronchial smooth muscle, uh, sorry, inflammatory cells. And because of uh, inhibition of it, they basically cause bronchodilatation. They are the non specific inhibition that decreases all the isoenzymes uh, weekly. And what does this uh, uh, phosphodiesterase they do? They decrease cyclic nucleotides. So uh, basically decrease the formation of cyclic GMP or cyclic EMP. Adenosine antagonism. Now adenosine they cause bronchoconstriction we know. They cause dilate cerebral blood vessels, depress cardiac pacemaker activity and inhibit gastric secretion. By antagonizing adenosine they uh, produce opposite effect thus causing bronchodilatation. Deacetylation of histone protein by activating histone deacetylase 2 thus they cause deacetylation of histone protein and thus decrease the inflammatory gene transcription. So they facilitate the effect of corticosteroids in bronchial asthma patient. Release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum particularly cardiac and skeletal muscle. Pharmacokinetics well absorbed orally 50% plasma protein bound distributed to all tissues. Important one is metabolized in liver primarily by CYP1A2 enzyme. So CYP, it has got interaction with CYP1A2 inducers and inhibitors. Inducers like smoking, phenytoin, phenobabiton, rifampicin and others, they basically increases the metabolism of theophylline and decreases the effect. Again, the CYP1A2 in inhibitors, erythromycin, Cimetidine, ciprofloxacin, oral contraceptive field, they basically uh, uh, increase the concentration of theophylline. Eliminated 10% unchanged urine, they have got pronounced inter individual variation, and the important one is metabolizing enzymes are saturable. Now, because of the saturability, the kinetics of elimination it changes from first order to zero order. As the concentration of theophylline is increased in body, the metabolic enzymes are not there to metabolize the theophylline. So what happens? The elimination decreases and the kinetics of elimination changes from first order to zero order. So it is one of the drugs following zero order kinetics. Adverse effect, it has got narrow margin of safety, headache, nervousness, nausea, gastric pain, rectal inflammation, rapid IV injection may cause precordial pain, syncope and death. Uses bronchial asthma and COPD, apnea in premature infant and acute left ventricular failure. 
anticholinergics. They are less effective bronchodilator than beta 2 agonist. They act on M3 receptors, uh, block G, C cube, phospholipase C, inositol triphosphate, calcium pathway and thus they produce bronchodilatation. Now the beta 2 agonist, their action is primarily on the small airways and anticholinergic they primarily act on the larger airways. Teplatropium bromide is shorter acting 4 to 6 hours, thiatropium bromide longer acting 24 hours. Now uh, anticholinergic they are the drug of choice in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Chronic uh, COPD patient we know it is an irreversible condition. So our primary aim is to reverse bronchoconstriction than to control inflammation because it is irreversible, there is no use of controlling inflammation. Now uh, the main reversible component of the COPD patients are parasympathetic tone, they are much much higher. So anticholinergic they play a great role in reversing the reversible component of airway obstruction in COPD. Uh, <coughs> combined with beta 2 agonist, the inhaled eplatropium bromide produce more marked, why? Because beta 2 agonists are acting on the shorter air, smaller airways and the anticholinergic they are acting on the larger airways. So they produce more marked bronchodilatation and action is longer lasting. Uh, how, uh, the problem with long acting muscarinic antagonists is that they may produce uh, urine retention because of anticholinergic side effect. They say should be used cautiously in patient with benign hyperplasia of prostate. Corticosteroids, now it is not a bronchodilator, it controls the inflammation, it is used for prophylaxis of bronchial asthma to reduce the frequency and amplitude of attack. So it is not a bronchodilator effect and not a bronchodilator, they inhibit inflammatory cytokine production and, uh, uh, and eosinophilic lymphocytic infiltration of lung. They inhibit the antigen antibody reaction, they reduce bronchial hyperreactivity, mucosal edema and again they cause upregulation of beta 2 receptors in the lung cells and leukocytes. So they increase the efficacy of the beta 2 organism too. They cause more sustained and complete symptomatic relief than bronchodilator or other drugs. Now among the as corticosteroids, the inhalational corticosteroids they can control asthma and they have, have very few adverse systemic side effects. Uh, in inhalation corticosteroids com when combined with beta 2 agonist, they are the drug of choice for the chronic asthma. Now systemic corticosteroids they are used in severe chronic asthma which is not controlled with uh, basically use of bronchodilators di dilators or the inhalation corticosteroids and requiring frequent hospitalization. The status asthmaticus where the asthma attack is not being controlled with even intensive bronchodilator therapy. COPD, in COPD exacerbations a short course of systemic corticosteroid may benefit some patient and reduce the days of hospitalization. Corticosteroids with shorter half life and brief period they are more preferred because they cause decrease, they are not associated with adrenocortical suppression. Now inhalational corticosteroids minimal side effects most suitable for long term treatment, they are not considered necessary for mild and episodic asthma. If a asthma is, if the asthma patient comes, it is uh, milder in uh, severity and it is episodic. In that case, generally we use short acting beta 2 agonist as and when basis. But inhalation corticosteroids they are indicated in persistent asthma, the asthma which is persistent, airway inflammation in COPD are not responsive to corticosteroids, we know COPD patients are irreversible. So inflammation control is uh, not helpful, so uh, airway inflammation in COPD are not responsive to corticosteroids. So in case of COPD patients, generally we do not prefer ICS, inhalation corticosteroids as an initial therapy. In those patients we prefer long acting muscarinic antagonist in addition with long acting beta 2 agonist. But when the COPD patients are advanced, advanced COPD patient with frequent exacerbation, then high dose ICS may be added in addition to long acting muscarinic antagonist and long acting beta 2 agonist. In therapeutic doses, 
the side effects with the inhalational corticosteroids are dry mouth the voice changes and oral candidiasis these are all preventable preventable by rinsing mouth with water after taking the pop puffs or and by using special now cyclosporine it has got a novel approach what does it it is basically a pro drug that is cleared by the esterase enzyme in the bronchial epithelial cells to active moiety now this active moiety again is less than one uh, is by oral by availability is less than 1% and it is even extensively bind to the plasma proteins so systemic side effect is very low it carries minimum risk of systemic toxicity coming to budesonide and fluticasone uh, they have got higher affinity for glucocorticoid receptors inhaled steroids are safer in pregnancy leukotriene antagonist again is used for prophylactic therapy it can be uh, five lipooxygenase inhibitor xylitol which inhibit the synthesis of leukotriene or it can be leukotriene receptor antagonist like montelukast they are they produce uh, they are, uh, leukotriene they are powerful mediator of inflammation they cause leukocyte recruitment bronchoconstriction increase capillary permeability now montelukast japilukast they are cystinyl leukotriene one receptor competitive antagonist they uh, basically they cause bronchodilatation they reduce the eosinophil count in the sputum they decrease the bronchial inflammation and hyperreactivity they are used for prophylactic therapy in mild to moderate cases of bronchial asthma they are effective in aspirin induced asthma and also exercise induced asthma but they are of no value in copd patient well absorbed orally highly plasma protein bound metabolized by cyp 2c9 enzyme xylitol is a five lipooxygenase inhibitor similar in action to the basically other uh, basically uh, montelukast chapilukast the problem is that it has got liver toxicity hepatotoxic potential so not used mast cell stabilizers they inhibit the degranulation of the mast cells and as well as other inflammatory cells they are used for prophylaxis they are not helpful in treatment of the acute attack of asthma uh, they are effect possibly due to involvement of the delayed chloride channel in the inflammatory cells uh, they are ineffective in acute attack administered as an aerosol not absorbed orally uses in bronchial asthma allergic uh, allergic rhinitis allergic conjunctivitis systemic toxicity is minimal ketotifen additionally they have got antihistaminic action along with the chromoglycate like action so because of this antihistaminic action they have got sedative effect they are infrequently used nowadays they are not a bronchodilator they are used for prophylaxis well tolerated sedation and dry mouth are common because of anticholinergic side effects dizziness nausea and weight gain may occur omalizumab is a ige humanized monoclonal antibody administered subcutaneously very expensive they are indicated in resistant asthma ineffective with other therapy with positive skin test and raised ige level now is a gina global initiative for asthma guideline 2022 now they have basically uh, sorted out the guideline in step wise therapy and depending on the severity of presentation if the patient is less severe less severity like symptoms less than twice a month then step one therapy is used if the symptom is four to five days a week step two therapy is used if the symptom in most of the days step 3 therapy is used daily symptom with ordinary activity step 4 and severe case step 5 now step 1 is basically uh, giving short acting beta 2 agonist as and when needed and addition of uh, basically as and when needed along with inhalation of corticosteroids step 2 is addition of maintenance of low dose inhaled in, uh, inhaled corticosteroid and short acting beta 2 agonist as and when needed 
step 3 is low, uh, low dose inhalation of corticosteroids with addition of long acting beta 2 agonist and short acting ones as and when needed step 4 addition of other drugs. Newer drugs for asthma, these include nitric oxide donors, nitric oxide donors basically nitric oxide inhalation is useful in asthma as it relaxes airway smooth muscles by, uh, in, uh, by increased formation of cyclic GMP. In upper airways, uh, basically it acts as a non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic neurotransmitter already said, nitric oxide donors are being investigated for acute severe asthma and, pro and uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. Benralizumab is a humanized IgG1 monoclonal antibody. They act against the IL5 receptor and uh, express on the eosinophils and basophils. They are used as an add-on therapy in severe eosinophilic asthma. Tegipelzumab basically the human monoclonal IgG antibody against thymic stromal lymphoprotein they reduce chronic inflammation and they are used as a maintenance therapy in severe asthma. Mepolizumab is a humanized IgG1 monoclonal antibody against interleukin 5. They inhibit IL5 binding to its receptor. They are used as an add-on therapy for severe asthma with eosinophilic phenotype. They are also used in hyper eosinophilic syndrome. Dupilumab is a monoclonal antibody binds to the IL4 receptor. They inhibit IL4 and IL13 downstream signaling. They are given subcutaneously with eosinophilic phenotype or corticosteroid dependent asthma. So, most of the uh, basic newer acting bronco as bronchial asthma drugs, they are either acting on IL5 or IL4. Treatment of status asthmaticus. It is an uh, acute life threatening event of exacerbation of bronchial asthma. Now, the treatment we can classify broadly into two groups is the general supportive care and the specific care. Now, general supportive care includes hospitalization, is a severe life threatening, uh, life threatening attack. So, we cannot keep the patient at home, hospitalize him, give moist oxygen, uh, if needed, uh, non invasive ventilation or invasive posi uh, positive pressure ventilation. Correction of dehydration, correction of metabolic alkalosis, and if there is any evidence of infection, use of specific antimicrobial agent. Specific treatment basically we use nebulizer therapy with short acting, uh, short acting beta 2 agonist like salbutamol or tributylene in addition with the uh, muscarinic antagonist. Again, we use uh, steroid, systemic or oral depending on the patient condition like in case systemic hydrocortisone is used or methylprednisolone is used. We can add aminophylline infusion if the attack is very severe not responding or the salbutamol or terbutaline may be added intravenously or subcutaneously. Magnesium sulfate has also got a role in, uh, uh, in reversing the status, uh, the status asthmaticus uh, in, uh, used for status asthmaticus treatment. General anesthetics like halothane they are used occasionally for the treatment of status asthmaticus in only selected cases. Now, COPD. COPD is a reversible airway obstruction unlike asthma, which is a reversible one. So, what is our main stay of treatment? To reverse the basically symptom, to reverse the air flow obstruction, nothing more. In the bronchial asthma patient, we were more considered, more, uh, more important was to control the inflammation, but not here. Clinical progress depends whether the chronic bronchitis uh, is predominant picture or the emphysema. Drugs relieve only symptoms without treating the underlying pathophysiology. Aim of treatment is to lessen airway obstruction, reduce respiratory symptom, improve quality of life, prevent and treat secondary complications like hypoxemia, hypercarbia, infection, cord pulmonary. Now, treatment option for COPD, very important, stop smoking is one of the risk factors. Now, as uh, influenza and pneumococcal vaccine is considered, so, uh, so that the patient is less prone to infection and lesser COPD exacerbation. Proper judicious use of antibiotic therapy, 
in respiratory tract infection. Long acting muscarinic antagonists, they are considered most effective bronchodilator in patient with COPD. In patient with bronchial asthma, the most effective ones are beta 2 agonists, but here long acting muscarinic antagonists. Current guidelines recommend combination of long acting muscarinic antagonists with long acting beta 2 agonists as an add on therapy with ICA, that is inhalation corticosteroid, as needed. Theophylline may be added orally in COPD patients. Rabipenicin is a novel long acting muscarinic antagonist. It produces sustained life uh, long acting bronchodilatation with fewer anticholinergic side effects. Systemic corticosteroid may be added orally if needed for a brief period of time. Domiciliary, domiciliary oxygen therapy. If the patient is persistently hypoxic, we know it is an irreversible condition. So, we, uh, if they require persistent oxygen, we may give oxygen therapy at home for in the daytime, say about 15 to 16 hours per day. Use of mucolytics and expectorants are controversial. Cuff is a protective reflex. What does cuff help? It helps to cuff out the uh, bronchial secretion or the foreign body in the, uh, in the uh, airways. So, the purpose is expulsion of respiratory secretion and foreign particles. So, they are helpful, protective. They occur due to stimulation of mechano and chemo receptors in the bronchial airways in the throat and respiratory passage. Causes of cough, it can be infective, bacterial, viral, fungal, inflammation, carcinoma, bronchogenic carcinoma, cigarette smoking, uh, uh, basically uh, we, we say smoker's cough, drugs, among them ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, acetylcysteine, amiodarone, and inner medication and iodine. Types of cuff, it can be productive cuff or useful cuff where the person cuff out expectoration, uh, cuff out bronchial secretion and dry cuff useless because there is no expectoration. Now, product, productive cuff, it serves to drain the airways, suppression is not desirable. We are getting out rid of the excess bronchial secretion and may even be harmful. But for dry cough, it is often more troublesome if it is very distressing to the patient or maybe harmful, then we suppress the cough, in, suppress the dry cough. Uh, harmful where in cardiac disease or after surgery patient. Now, the drugs uh, used for cough therapy, it can be antitussives. What does they cause? They may basically uh, depress the cough center in the brain or they may reduce the tussel impulses in the respiratory tract. So, they decrease the curve. And expectorants, either they uh, increase the uh, coughing out of secretion or they decrease the viscosity of the secretion. Antitussives can be centrally acting, opioids, non-opioids, opioids like codeine, falcodine, non-opioids like noscapine, dextromethorphan, uh, clofedianol, peripherally acting, Pharyngeal demulsions with lozenges, syrups, steam inhalation, bronchodilators. Now, benzonated can be centrally and peripherally acting. Expectorant secretion enhances, they increase the secretion. Guipenesine, potassium citrate, potassium iodide, aluminum fluoride, and others. Mucolytics, they include bromaxine. Mucolytics basically they increase, decreases the viscosity of the bronchial secretion. Bromhexine, Ambroxol, Carbocysteine, Acetylcysteine. Among the expectorants, the drug which is marketed in United States is basically only one, guaifenesine. So, United States FDA has approved only guaifenesine as an expectorant. Antitussives, antitussives basically they decreases the cuff, suppresses the cuff, either they act centrally by acting at the cuff center or they act peripherally in the respiratory tract. Now, they should be used only in dry cough if it is distressing to the patient or if it is harmful. Opioid antitussives, morphine and its congeners, they are most effective antitussive, but morphine is not suitable because of uh, addictive liability and because of respiratory depression action. Now, with codeine, it is more selective for the cough center, addictive liability is lesser, Constipation is a severe problem with the drug, so it should always be used with a laxative 
and higher doses can cause respiratory depression particularly in case of children they are contraindicated in asthma patient and in patient with decreased respiratory reserve they should be avoided in children so ethyl morphine like that of codeine but they have got less constipation effect pol codeine similar but longer acting with no analgesic and no addicting property non opioid antidepressant it include noscapine suppresses cough no analgesic no opioid action so no analgesic no dependent property and they can release histamine so they can produce bronchospasm in asthmatic patient dextromethorphan they suppress central nmda receptor uh, the problem is that although they are non opioid they can be addicting to the some drug abusers and uh, they uh, does not cause constipation clofidianol central antidepressant with weak antihistaminic anticholinergic and local anesthetic property pharyngeal demulcent they coat the pharynx soothing effect so they decreases the cough originating above the larynx they produce symptomatic relief used as and when needed include lozenges syrups glycerin liquorice benzonate benzonate can act centrally can act peripherally now structurally related to local anesthetic tetracaine so they have got mild anesthetic action they inhibit pulmonary stress receptor and suppress the cough center steam inhalation is the economical and the safe method most uh, economical and safe useful for cough originating below the larynx they liquefy the tenacious sputum uh, they are highly useful in bronchiectasis and steam inhalation being most economical and devoid of any side effect can be considered as a best expectorant mucolytic or cough suppressant bronchodilators they are effective in cough due to bronchospasm like salbutamol tributylene all the fdcs fixed dose combinations available that contain multiple drugs for cough in which one of them is, is a bronchodilator are irrational and should never be used antihistaminics many h1 antihistaminics like diphenhydramine dimethyldrenate promethazine they are used the problem is sedation they just suppress the cough center used in dry cough sedative effect is not desirable they also dry up bronchial secretion so antihistaminics are lesser preferred it would be better to use antihistamine in dry and trouble uh, trouble some cough rather than using antihistamines so dry cough eh, tumar antihistamine use kora better compared to antihistamine because they are drying up bronchial secretion and has got sedative effect local anesthetics lignocaine particularly they are administered by nebulizer in intractable cough in bronchogenic carcinoma again when endoscopies are used they are, uh, basically they prevent cough uh, by inhaling topically in the airways airways they are used as lozenges for intractable cough and painful acute sore throat hydration by maintaining adequate hydration they reduce the viscosity of the bronchial secretion it is recommended to take plenty of water in tenacious sputum which is highly effective without costing anything expectorants what does they cause they basically uh, increase the bronchial secretion or reduce its viscosity that is secretion enhances or mucolytic they facilitate the removal of the cough now mucolytics are specifically useful in patient with tracheostomy asthmatic bronchitis cystic fibrosis where there is thick tenacious sputum or mucus plugs secretion enhances sodium and potassium citrate potassium iodide yphenesin vasaka tolubalasam and ammonium salts US FDA has stopped marketing of all expectorants except yphenesin bromhexin it's a derivative of alkaloid uh, uh, vasicin obtained from other to the vasica they cause deep polymerization of the mucopolysaccharide present in the sputum or the cough uh, directly as well as by liberating lysosomal enzyme so network of fibers in the sputum is broken and the sputum is less viscous 
they are particularly useful if mucus plugs are present. Ambroxol is a metabolite of bromexin, action is more or less similar. Acetyl cysteine, they open up disulfide bonds uh, in the mucoproteins and thus they liquefy the sputum. They are administered orally by inhalation route or by nebulization. In intubated patient even, in intubated patients even, the, uh, the uh, basically acetyl cysteine, they can be administered directly to the uh, bronchial airway. And then the problem with the uh, acetyl cysteine is basically they can cause bronchospasm. Carbocysteine is similar to that of acetyl cysteine. That's all.